Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Sawadee kap. Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our online class session to practice some of the teachings that we've been learning throughout this group learning program. On Wednesdays, we do breathing mindfulness meditation, loving kindness meditation, and Buddhist chanting. And we rotate these every three weeks to help you develop your life practice and this foundation that you're going to need in order to apply all the other teachings from Gautama Buddha. On Sundays, we go into a chapter of this book, Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Nibbana. And this week, we're on chapter three, which is what is enlightenment or Nibbana. And in that chapter, we're explaining and discussing what is this mental state of enlightenment. And each Sunday, we progress in this book one chapter at a time over the course of six months. But we carve out these Wednesdays in order to really focus in on meditation and chanting because this is the foundation of our practice in which all the other teachings kind of apply to what we're doing. So as we get going into the program starting this Sunday, we're going to be exploring chapter four, which is the Four Noble Truths, where you're going to be learning about what's the primary problem in the mind of why we experience all this sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fears, boredom, loneliness, shyness, jealousy, resentment, all of these discontent feelings, the Buddha is going to explain to you in four simple statements of what the problem is, the cause of the problem, how to eliminate it, and then the entire path forward of how to eliminate it from the mind 100%. And part of that solution that he offers in the Four Noble Truths is meditation. That's part of the solution, but it's not the entire solution. So we wouldn't be able to meditate our way to enlightenment, but we also wouldn't be able to attain enlightenment without meditation. So that's why meditation is really a foundational practice that we build the rest of our practice on top of. And chanting is something that we use in order to assist us easing the mind into meditation. So we're going to be talking about chanting and sharing what it is and how to practice it in today's class session so that if you would like to incorporate this into your life practice as part of your meditation practice, you'll be able to start using this chanting in a beneficial way to help you develop your life practice and get more and more benefit out of your meditation sessions. So let's talk a little bit about what chanting is and let's talk about what chanting isn't before we actually go in and actually start learning chanting directly. So during the lifetime of Gautama Buddha, who lived over 2,500 years ago, all of his teachings were oral. And as he taught and people learned his teachings, the mind became more enlightened, which with that is going to come focus, concentration, deep memory, and clarity of thought. These qualities of mind are going to come through along with the mind being peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy permanently, along with the human being conducting themselves in a very polite, very kind, very caring, very loving, very compassionate, very friendly, very respectful way, an enlightened being or someone on that path is going to start having this focus, this concentration, this 
memory and this clarity of thought where the mind becomes singular focused and now these benefit you in daily life so in your personal and professional relationships this focus this concentration memory and clarity of thought becomes very beneficial in your personal and professional relationships so as the buddha was teaching over 2500 years ago because it was an oral tradition and nobody was writing things down during his lifetime the way that they memorized the teachings is through chanting they would actually chant the teachings and this helped them to develop their focus concentration their memory and their clarity of thought and when they did their chanting they chanted in whatever language the buddha was speaking at that time the source text that we use today as the source and the most complete collection of Gautama Buddha's teachings is called the Pali Canon or Pali text. Pali is a language that dates back in history that is no longer a spoken language today. But the vast majority of everything that we understand about the Buddhist teachings comes from that Pali Canon. We at one time really thought that Gautama Buddha actually spoke in Pali. And most people in the world will tell you that he did speak in Pali. But in the last few years, researchers and archaeologists have uncovered texts that date prior to the Pali Canon. And the language that the Buddhist teachings were written down in in those texts were kind of a precursor to Pali. They were a language prior to Pali. So the Buddha may or may not have actually spoken Pali. He may have spoken in a language that was prior to Pali. However, the source of the teachings that we source are in the Pali language. So the chanting that we do now, 2,500 years later, is in the Pali language. We chant in this Pali language as kind of a reverence or an appreciation for these teachings that have been handed down all of these years over time to now that they've actually reached us. The chants themselves and the words themselves are just words and the vast majority of the world doesn't understand Pali and you don't ever really need to understand Pali because nowadays the teachings are in localized languages, one being English, that you don't really need to go back and actually learn Pali. That would take a really, really long time and a lot of people don't even agree what one word versus another actually means. So you would just be really putting an obstacle in front of you to need to go back and learn Pali, then learn the Buddhist teachings, then actually practice them, then the number of people that you have available to you to actually talk about the teachings and gain assistance and guidance are very few because there's hardly anybody that really understands Pali nowadays. So you can actually overt that obstacle and just move right into learning in English, which is a language that you already know. And by learning in English, you can start applying the teachings right away and you can start seeing the results. And you have this really wide community of teachers and practitioners that you can talk to and get guidance and help on this path to enlightenment. So even though we teach in English and all the teachings that we share in English, we still chant in this Pali language as a way of kind of respecting the teachings that have been handed down all these years. In fact, the tradition of Buddhism that dates closest to the lifetime of the Buddha is called the Theravada tradition of Buddhist teachings or Theravada Buddhism. Theravada means teachings of the elders. It's essentially a tradition of Buddhist teachings that feels that it's best to maintain the teachings as close to what existed during the lifetime of the Buddha as possible, rather than kind of all these adaptations and changes that have happened since his death, because it's his teachings that came from the actual Buddha that lead to enlightenment. Not all the various touches and changes and adaptations of people since his death, because those people aren't Buddhas, but this Buddha who lived over 2,500 years ago, he self awakened, he discovered these teachings on his own, awakened to enlightenment, shared these teachings during his lifetime where countless other people became enlightened. And then since his death, many, many countless other people have become enlightened since his actual death. So that's one of the reasons 
why we know that he was an actual Buddha. So this tradition of Buddhist teachings, the Theravada tradition, feels that it's best to focus on his teachings, not all the other people that have come after him and made their various changes. And the way that you know that you're learning his teachings is because as you learn his teachings, your mind becomes more and more awake. You develop focus, concentration, memory, clarity of thought. Your mind becomes more peaceful, more calm, more serene, more content with joy. So you see the improvement in the condition of the mind where what you're doing and how you're practicing the teachings, you see the improvements for yourself. So that's how you know that you're on the path and you're making progress because you see the improvement in the progress in the mind. You see the mind improving, the condition of the mind, and you see your life improve as well. So it's self-evident that you see the improvements in your life. So this chanting that we do in the Pali language, while we're paying respect to Gautama Buddha and the elders who passed down this knowledge throughout all these years, what we're also doing is we are improving our focus. We're improving our concentration. We're improving our memory and our clarity of thought. Because in order to learn these chants and actually chant them, you have to develop a certain amount of memorization. You have to develop a certain amount of concentration. So just the exercise of picking up some chants and learning those over the course of a few weeks and a few months and refining your practice more and more of chanting those teachings in the Pali language, it's going to develop this focus, this concentration, this memory, this clarity of thought. The other thing it does is as you're working through these chants, it's kind of like an audible sound that really helps you to see that your practice is improving. Because depending on how your practice progresses, it might be several weeks or several months before you kind of notice some changes. But with these chants, there's this audible sound that you keep hearing day after day after day that keeps getting better and better and better. So it can be quite motivating for a beginning practitioner to follow these chants and practice them and actually see the audible sound get better and better. It also helps you as you chant these before meditation and after meditation. Before meditation, it helps you to start becoming aware of the mind and aware of the breath. Because getting into breathing mindfulness meditation, one of the goals is to develop awareness of mind. This is mindfulness. What mindfulness is, is having awareness of mind. Because this journey to enlightenment is a purification of the mind. And in order to purify the mind, you need to understand the mind, you need to be aware of the mind, you need to know what thoughts and ideas and feelings are inside the mind. So developing awareness of mind or mindfulness is really helpful, not only in meditation, but in daily life, so that as you feel frustration arise, or anger, or shyness, or boredom, you're aware of it because you have awareness of mind. So by learning chanting, as you develop this memory and concentration and clarity of thoughts and all of these other qualities of mind, paying respect to the elders, hearing this audible sound, you're also developing awareness of mind as you become more and more aware of the mind through actually doing the chants you also become aware of the breath during chanting because you can't just take one deep breath and then do all the chants. You actually have to be very intentional about taking breaths at different times. So this chanting actually eases the mind into meditation because you start becoming aware of the mind, you start becoming aware of the breath, you hear this audible sound that kind of coaxes the mind and kind of eases it down into meditation to get more benefit out of your meditation itself. And then when you're done, the chanting helps to ease your mind back out of meditation. What Gautama Buddha referred to this easing the mind down into meditation, he referred to it as setting up mindfulness in front of you. When he talks about meditation and he talks about how to do meditation, he says prior to meditation, you should set up mindfulness in front of you. 
And what he's saying is you should set up awareness of mind in front of you so that you start becoming aware of the mind as you ease the mind down into meditation. Well, how each person does that is going to be very different, right? Because these practices aren't about everybody doing it exactly the same because that's impossible. That would be permanence. There is no permanence other than enlightenment itself. So everyone's going to set up mindfulness differently. And this is why the Buddha didn't say exactly how to set up mindfulness in front of you. He just said, set up mindfulness in front of you. So how you choose to become aware of the mind and aware of the breath and ease the mind into meditation is totally up to you. Based on the practices that I've learned with Buddhist chanting, this has really helped me to set up mindfulness in front of me, become aware of the mind and aware of the breath. So I share this in this program so that you can use it, you can learn it and then use it and see how it works for you. See if you get that same appreciation for the elders. See if you start developing focus, concentration, memory, clarity of thought. See if you start having this audible sound that you hear and it kind of eases the mind into meditation and it can motivate you because the mind starts hearing this better and better sound of chanting. And you start becoming aware of the mind and the breath as you prepare for meditation. So I invite you to learn this Buddhist chanting with me today and throughout this program so that you can use it and see how it benefits your practice. And if you get a lot of benefit out of it and it's working for you, great, then use it. But if there's any point in time you're like, ah, this really isn't for me, then just move it to the side and do whatever you feel is best for you to set up mindfulness in front of you. You may go to the bathroom, empty out the organs. You might do a little bit of stretching or yoga. You might listen to a little bit of music. You might take a walk. Whatever it is, you're going to do something to kind of like start becoming aware of the mind and aware of the breath to kind of ease the mind into meditation. Because we all know what happens when you first get that thought of, you know, I'd kind of like to do some meditation. What happens is typically the mind wants to run. Right. The mind's like, no, you don't want to do meditation. You want to get on Facebook and play with your friends and talk with your friends. No, you don't want to do meditation. You want to go outside and do some gardening. No, you don't want to do meditation. You want to watch some more TV. Right. That's what you really want to do. Right. 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 So this is usually what happens in the mind when the mind says, hey, I would like to do some meditation. You have that conscious thought. There's always something that's like, no, 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 no. You don't want to do that. You want to do this over here instead. But it's that conscious choice, that good choice that you make that says, no, I'm not going to do those things. I'm going to do some meditation. And one of the things that can kind of draw you into meditation is that you have this chanting practice, this interesting thing that you're working at. Maybe you have like a little cheat sheet that you print out and you laminate with the actual chants. Or maybe you use the book in chapter 11, which has these chants. And maybe you use that as a guide to kind of learn these chants little by little by little. And it helps to kind of draw the mind into this practice. Because if you're in your life watching TV and you're having a good time with your family or your friends and you have that conscious thought about, meditating, oh, I really want to go be quiet for 30 minutes or an hour or 10 minutes or two hours. No, I don't really want to do that. I'm, I'm having too much fun right here. All this fun with my friends and my family. And no, I don't want to do that. But if you have this other thing that's kind of like enjoyable and fun, which is, hey, I'm going to go do these chants and I'm going to have fun, you know, chanting these and kind of seeing how I do and each day I get a little bit better and a little bit better, this can be really motivating to kind of draw the mind into meditation and give you something other than just sitting there and being quiet for 30 minutes or an hour, however long that is. That sometimes by itself can be really interesting, especially if your life's pretty hectic. Just the idea of being peaceful and calm and going into meditation can draw you into it. But Buddhist chanting is another way that you can do that. So now that we've talked about what Buddhist chanting is, let's talk about what it isn't, okay? 
What Buddhist chanting isn't, is it isn't prayer. You're not actually chanting in order to create some benefit for somebody else or create some special thing. There's no special, magical, superstitious powers in the chanting itself. Now you will hear or you will read in other places that if you just chant these words over and over and over again, there's going to be some beneficial thing that's going to happen. You're going to get good luck or you're going to get a long life or you're going to eliminate all your unwholesome gamma or it's going to benefit your dead relatives or any number of things. You know, people might even say that if you chant this, you know, every day for however many weeks or years you're going to get to enlightenment. Well, that's not how chanting works. Chanting itself is really nothing more than sound and air coming from your mouth. What the real benefit in chanting is, is not this superstitious, mystical, magical powers of some kind of words to miraculously do something in the world. The real benefit in the chanting for me is cultivating this gratitude and appreciation for the elders that have passed the teachings down to us. Having this practice that becomes better and better and better and kind of motivates me in my practice to learn and continue to pursue. Chanting for me is developing this focus, this concentration, this memory, this clarity of thought. Chanting for me is developing this awareness of mind and awareness of breath that eases the mind into meditation so that I can get more benefit out of the meditation. Because the meditation is the training of the mind. We're training the mind during the meditation. That's where the real benefits come in. Gautama Buddha never taught rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship. Even though in a lot of Buddhist centers you will see rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship, this isn't what actually leads to enlightenment. It's the training of the mind that leads to enlightenment. Learning the teachings, reflecting on those, and applying them in daily life to include meditation, which is training of the mind. So this chanting is nothing more than sounds and air coming from your mouth. That doesn't have any special power to create any mystical, magical, superstitious things in the world. But what these chants do is if you approach them in the way that I've shared, again, it cultivates this gratitude and appreciation for the elders. It gives you this practice that you can gradually see is improving to motivate you and encourage you in your practice. It gives you this focus, this concentration, this memorization, this clarity of thought, and it helps you to start becoming aware of the mind, aware of the breath, and ease the mind in the meditation so that you get more benefit out of the actual meditation session itself. Then when you're done, you can then ease the mind back out of meditation rather than just kind of pop out of meditation and whoa, I'm back in the world again. You can kind of ease the mind back out. So I'm gonna stop and pause and see if there's any questions. And then afterwards, we're gonna actually go through and learn three very important chants that are chanted throughout the Buddhist world. And you'll be able to actually go into Theravada Buddhist communities and chant right alongside of every other practitioner. There's millions of practitioners in the world that are using these same chants. So whether you're on your own as your own practice, whether you're with us on these Wednesdays when we do meditation and chanting, whether you decide to go to a Theravada Buddhist temple and join other practitioners, you'll be able to chant these same chants and then actually participate right along with everyone else. So we're going to do that today. And then we might even kind of slip in a little bit of meditation so that you can see how these chants can kind of ease the mind into meditation and then ease it back out. But let me pause here and see if there's any questions on anything we've been discussing so far before we actually move into learning the actual chants. Hi, David. So on our talk on Sunday, we covered the topic, what is Nirvana? And we talked about rites and rituals and how in order to attain the first stage of enlightenment, one would need to eliminate attachment to rites and rituals. Is this a kind of ritual what we're about to do? 
And why is it that we still see a lot of rituals being done by Buddhist practitioners from all lineages? And what purpose do they serve? Sure. So this isn't a rite ritual ceremony or worship. What this is, is it's a practice that's essentially further training the mind, right? Meditation itself is training the mind, but by you needing to learn these chants, by you needing to memorize them, by you needing to focus on them, have concentration, have clarity of thought, that exercise of doing this, you know, five or 10 minutes before your meditation, that is training of the mind. And then doing it after your meditation, that's an exercise, a practice, that is training the actual mind. So it's not a right ritual ceremony or worship because we're not looking for anything beneficial to come from it externally. What we're looking to do with this chanting is benefit our mind through training the mind itself. So it's not a right ritual ceremony or worship. It's a individual practice that you can use and then you can see the benefit of actually learning it and practicing it. You can independently observe that the more you learn these chants, the more you practice them, the more that you implement them as part of your meditation practice, you will get all those benefits that I've already talked about as part of this practice, okay? Why do we see so many rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship in Buddhist communities? This is because of impermanence. We're gonna talk about this on Sunday, about how things aren't fixed. There's not this fixed permanent state. You know, you would think that this Buddha arises 2,500 years ago, teaches these deep, profound teachings where all these people are getting enlightened, and then those teachings are going to stay exactly the same for 2,500 years. Well, the first 500 years, they were pretty well intact, and lots and lots of people continue to get enlightenment during the first 500 years after the Buddha's death. But then over time, they slowly started to degrade and people started changing and modifying and adapting them. As they started moving throughout the world and into different cultures, these different cultures didn't just learn this kind of pure Buddhism. They learned this kind of adapted Buddhist teachings and they kind of put their cultural slant on it. Like here in Thailand, people have put you know, astronomy into it. They've put animism into it. They've put Hinduism into it. They've put all these other things. So when you show up to a Buddhist community, they're not all practicing the same thing. Each temple is doing something very different. And based on the practice of the head monk, that particular temple is going to be doing whatever they choose to actually do. And because the teachings have been handed down for over 2,500 years, this degradation of the teachings has happened more and more and more and more and more over the years. And what we see in some centers is this unknowing of true reality. They don't have the pure teachings of the Buddha where he specifically says that he doesn't teach rites, rituals, and ceremonies, and these things don't lead to enlightenment. You would think that, you know, like everybody has a copy of the Buddhist teachings, and that just gets handed down for over 2,500 years. But remember, when things were written down right after his life, they didn't have the materials and ability to preserve things the way that we do now. They were essentially writing on palm leaf manuscripts. They would take these palm leaves and they would dry them out and they would write out the teachings. And then over time, the moisture would affect those, the ink would smudge a little bit, people would carry them around, and they didn't have a a hard drive to store these on. They didn't have a photocopying machine to photocopy these things. What they would do is they would re-dry some more palm leaves. Somebody would literally copy from one leaf to the next. And remember, these leaves are imperfect as well. So If something grew on the leaf, maybe, you know, a slight little dark spot on the leaf might have changed the word slightly here or there. But what we've gotten to today is we've gotten to 45 volumes of these thick books that are very, very thick that have the Buddhist teachings translated from Pali. This particular book has the Pali and the English together, so you can see both together. And these 45 volumes of books are pretty extensive. 
and not everybody has access to them. You would think that there would just be one source and everybody would go to that one source and then they would be spread throughout the world, but that's permanence and that's not how the world works. Everything is impermanent. So there's all these various perspectives and all these various sources all over the world of what people say are the Buddhist teachings and all these different communities are practicing the teachings in different ways. But the way that you know whether you're actually getting the true teachings of the Buddha or not is based on the condition of the mind. If you're observing that the condition of the mind is improving more and more and more, then you know you're learning the right stuff. So you have the independent verification that the teachings are true. That's the big thing. But also, when somebody's teaching you, they should be able to show you how their teachings are true, not based on belief, because none of these teachings are based in belief. So if somebody's teaching you a chant and they say, okay, chant this every day and X, Y, Z will happen. Okay, show it to me. How does that happen? Right? Like, like let's say, okay, you're going to get a longer life if you chant this for every day. Okay, how does that happen? I say the words and then what happens? How does my life become longer? They should be able to prove it to you in an independent way that you can go off and verify it. Because if this is true, then in their community, there should be a bunch of 150 year old people or a bunch of 120 year old people sitting around because everybody's chanting this and now everybody's got a longer life. But if they're saying that this chant extends your life, but there's nobody around that's 120, 150 years old and there's not this large community of people that are that age, then there's no truth there. So one of the things that you will see as I teach, especially starting on Sunday, is I will share a teaching with you and then I will help you to see how to independently observe that it's true. Because by you independently observing that it's true, then you've got wisdom. And it's this wisdom that is going to lead to your enlightenment. The way that the mind becomes enlightened is through wisdom. That's what we call awakening. Essentially, what your mind's awakening to is you're awakening to this wisdom. So now the mind has all these certain thoughts and different things that are in the mind, but these things are not 100% true. The only way to get to an awakened, enlightened mind is you need to independently be able to verify what it is that I'm teaching you. So when I share the teachings with you, I will say, okay, here's the teaching, and now here's how you can independently observe that it's true. Now go off and practice that, and you'll see that it's true for yourself. And if you're not able to do this with a teacher's teachings, then they're not going to lead to wisdom. So if someone's teaching rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship, then those things are all about belief. And there's never a time in Gautama Buddha's teachings where he says, just believe me. Just believe me. Can you just believe me? No, because belief doesn't lead to awakening. It doesn't lead to wisdom. It doesn't lead to enlightenment. So the Buddha never used the words, just believe what I say, okay? He always encouraged people to learn and practice the teachings so that you can see the truth for yourself. And that's also what I do as well. But because of this impermanence, you're going to see lots and lots of people who are doing rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship. You don't want to judge those people. You don't want to look down on them. You don't want to think that they've done anything bad. It's just that where they are in the world and as the teachings have made their way down to them, they're just unknowing. They're just unaware. They haven't had access to the actual teachings of the Buddha. And as long as that's the case, then they won't get enlightened. They have to eliminate this fetter of wrong observances and wrong behaviors. What wrong observances and wrong behaviors is, this third fetter, is essentially someone who thinks and believes that rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship is going to lead to enlightenment. And if that's in the mind, if someone thinks that sprinkle some water on me and that's going to lead to my enlightenment, 
or tie this string on my wrist and that's going to lead to enlightenment or ring these bells and that's going to lead to enlightenment or hit this gong and that's going to lead to enlightenment or say these words over and over and over again and that's going to lead to enlightenment they're not fully understanding that those things don't lead to enlightenment and as long as they believe those things and they don't understand the truth then as long as they hold on to that fetter in the mind they won't ever be able to attain enlightenment a person to attain enlightenment has to eliminate that from the mind recognizing that it's not rites ritual ceremonies and worship that leads to enlightenment it's training the mind it's learning the teachings applying them in life applying them in practice through meditation yes but also in daily life and by training the mind in this way that's what will lead to enlightenment not this ceremonies and worship and all those things and the buddha taught this because he observed during his lifetime that people were doing rites rituals worship and ceremonies he saw that going on in his life and he knew that that wasn't beneficial in people's life and that's why it was part of his teachings that these things don't lead to enlightenment got it thank you david that's very helpful so certainly seems that a recurring point here is to observe the results in one's own mind because not only then will you figure out what is true what isn't what works what doesn't but also you'll be able to fine tune your approach. What works for you, what works today, what works tomorrow, and that's gonna change from day to day. And these are things we need to be mindful of as we practice this because the mind is gonna have different needs at different times. And so it helps to know not only what works, but what works when and how much and to what extent we need to meditate and you know how long do we need to chant for and this kind of thing. So it really is also about fine-tuning this, I feel. Right, so what the Buddhist teachings are doing is training the mind to come into the present moment and observe this focus, this concentration, this memory, this clarity of thought, this peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy in this present moment. So if we're doing rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship for some beneficial result in the future, well, enlightenment is all about right now, the present moment. Is the mind peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy? It's not about obtaining some kind of future benefit. It's about right now, let's do something that trains the mind and improves the condition of the mind right now. And then you can observe the improvements to the mind through your daily life. And you observe that the condition of the mind and your life is getting better and better. Okay, we have a question from Sue. Will a Theravada temple be closest to the original teachings? I would say yes, but also even within the Theravada tradition, there's lots of changes and adaptations. So in the book that I wrote, Developing a Life Practice, at the very end, chapter 24, there's a chapter called Misunderstandings of Gautama Buddha's Teachings. And in there, I list some of the major misunderstandings within the Theravada tradition, but also within other traditions as well. But I didn't go into all the different misunderstandings in the other traditions because that doesn't make sense to do that. But mainly what I was focusing in on that chapter is helping you understand the misunderstandings within the Theravada tradition. So you'll go to some temples that will sprinkle water around and they say that this is beneficial or some Theravada temples will tie strings on your wrist and that's supposed to be beneficial, but it's not. There's some temples that will pour water into a little urn and they say that you're transferring merit or transferring you know, good, wholesome benefits to the dead relatives. All of these things are adaptations that have happened since Gautama Buddha's death. So you'll have the best chance of finding the pure teachings at a Theravada temple but what you're gonna notice is even within some of the Theravada temples, many of them, they're actually doing things that are not the Gautama Buddha's teachings. But by learning these teachings and observing the quality of the mind improving, you will know that this is the truth for yourself. And if you're just interested in joining a temple, after having learned these teachings here, you will at least be able to enter into that community and you will be able to appreciate and understand what people are doing and that they're actually 
have modified the teachings and they're practicing a modified form of the teachings, but you'll be able to identify it and you'll be able to know that this is the life practice that is leading to my improvement of the condition of my mind, but these other things, this rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worships that are happening even within Theravada temples, you'll know that that's not part of the Buddhist teachings, but you just won't maybe participate or you'll participate, but you'll know that it doesn't lead to anything beneficial. You certainly won't judge those people for doing that, but you will see some things at various Theravada temples that aren't Gautama Buddha's teachings because there's even been impermanence that affected those teachings as well. We have a question from Judith. Are there any temples where they don't do these rituals and ceremonies? Yes, I've been to over 200 Theravada temples throughout the world, mainly in America and Thailand. I've been to over 200. I stopped counting pretty much. And out of all those various temples that I've been to, I've only ever been to one temple that doesn't do all of this modifications of the teachings. And it's down in Bangkok, or we call Krung Tep in Thailand. They also have another one up here in Chiang Mai as well, but I haven't been to that one yet. But this one temple is really well known for sticking true to the teachings of Gautama Buddha. In fact, the leader of that temple used to be part of another group of monks. And because he was really interested in keeping it close to what the Buddha taught in the actual Pali text, he had to kind of break away from the people who he was with and start his own temple because those people disagreed with what he was sharing from the text of the Buddha, right? You would think that if somebody came forward and said, hey, look, everything that we're doing in this temple, it doesn't match to what the source text is of the Buddha. It doesn't match. You would think that everyone would be like, oh, sure. Okay, well, let's do what the Buddha did. But because these people have this craving, this anger, this ignorance or unknowing of true reality, and they're holding on to what it is that they've been taught all these years, even when somebody steps up and says, hey, look, this isn't what the Buddha taught. We shouldn't do this. Members in the community are like, no, 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 we're, we're going to do this. So he had to break away and create his own environment. And he did that about 10 or 12 years ago. And the temple is very, very successful. It draws hundreds of thousands of people. I was there last in 2018 in November. We went for a big event at 4 a.m. in the morning when we got there. There was already like 20,000 people there. And by the time the event really kicked off, like 7 a.m. in the morning, there was probably 50,000 people at this temple. And people were just coming and coming and coming. And that's how you know in Thailand, a place that really has the true, pure teachings, is there's going to be lots and lots of people that become attracted to it because they're getting benefit. And as they see the benefit and the improvement in their mind, they will bring their friends and their family and their grandmother and their grandfather like, hey, this is really helping me. So there's this enormous community. And that's where I source all the teachings that I have is from that temple because they've done such a good job of curating the true teachings of the Buddha and making sure that only what they produce is the pure teachings of the Buddha. So all the translations that I use come from that temple. Very interesting. Thank you, David. We have no more questions at the moment. Okay, so let's go into the actual chants and actually learn chanting in the Pali language. Okay, this first chant that I will share with you is kind of the first chant that people learn when they're growing up in Thailand as a child. This one and maybe the next one, the second one that I'm teaching you. This is the chant that is going to kind of kick off pretty much every event within a Buddhist environment, a Theravada Buddhist temple. So if you're going to some event like a New Year's event or the Buddha's birthday or the date of his death or the date of his enlightenment or any of these other holidays that you might decide to go visit a temple or even just on a regular average day, temples are set up where the monks are chanting in the morning and in the night and if you want to join, you can just go in and join. This is pretty much going to be the chant that everyone starts off with. This chant is called 
they chant to the triple gem or the triple jewel. What the triple gem or the triple jewel is, is it's the three things that you pretty much need in order to attain enlightenment. You wouldn't be able to attain enlightenment without these three things. First one is the Buddha, the Dhamma or his teachings, and then the third thing is the Sangha or the community of practitioners. So in order to attain enlightenment, you would need to have confidence in the Buddha. You would need to have confidence that this person was actually enlightened, right? Because if you didn't have confidence that he was actually enlightened, why would you ever even go any further? So you need to have confidence that the Buddha was enlightened. And then the second thing is you need to have access to his teachings and you need to be able to learn his teachings and what are the actual teachings that lead to enlightenment, which you guys have. And then the third thing you need is you need access to the community. You need guidance from a teacher, from the Sangha, we call the community. The Sangha is the people who are learning and practicing the teachings of the Buddha, which in the world, there's about 500 million people that are considering themselves practitioners of Gautama Buddha's teachings. So you would need to have the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, or the Buddha, who's the master teacher, access to the actual teachings and access to the community of people who are learning and practicing those teachings. This is the triple gem or the triple jewel. Whenever you see anything that's three in the Buddhist teachings, it's always relating to this. So you might see people do things like three times, like at a holiday, they might walk around the temple three times. And this is the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, right? So this first chant is three different phrases. One, the first one is for the Buddha. The second one is for the Dhamma or the teachings. And then the third one is for the Sangha or the community of practitioners. So looking at this first chant, let me just share with you the Pali and then we can do it together as a group. Okay. I will start with the first phrase and we'll just do that first phrase. Here's how it sounds. Ara hang sama sam hoto makawa potang makawan hang api wate ami. And then you usually raise your hands up to your forehead at the end of that to kind of show respect to the Buddha. And if you're in a large community, they may actually bow to the ground as a way of showing respect to the Buddha, okay? So this is the Pali, and you practice this over and over and over again until you get better and better at it, and you refine your focus, your concentration, your memory, and your clarity of thought. What this means in English is the perfectly enlightened one is worthy and rightly self-awakened. I bow down before the awakened, perfectly enlightened one, okay? The Buddha himself didn't make this chant, okay? He didn't go around telling people to bow down to him, but people respected him so much during his lifetime, they did. He didn't teach like, okay, thou shalt bow in front of me whenever you see me, right? Because that's arrogance, that's ego. So he never taught that. But because people have such reverence and appreciation for him, it's kind of customary to kind of bow and show respect if you like. You don't have to. Not everybody does. Some people just put their hands up to their forehead and that's it. So what a Buddha is, is a self-awakened individual. So that's what we're kind of saying here in this chant is, okay, you're the perfectly enlightened one. You awoke by yourself. Where everyone else who awakens they're learning from teachers. So what they're learning is coming from another teacher. And this is how over 2,500 years, there was kind of these changes and adaptations slowly, slowly, slowly to the point now where the teachings have almost become invisible in the world today. But what a perfectly enlightened one or a fully perfectly enlightened Buddha is going to do is they are going to awaken on their own without the guidance of teachers. So their wording and their phrasing, how they describe the teachings is going to be very unique. 
It's not going to be like any other teacher. So when a Buddha awakens, they are self-awakened on their own without the guidance of any teachers. They attain this enlightened mental state and discover and become aware of exactly what it took them to attain enlightenment. Because if they try something and it doesn't work, they're going to kick it out because it doesn't awaken the mind. But if they do something and it works to awaken their mind, they know that that's part of the path. And now once a person fully awakens on their own without the help of any teachers, now they start teaching and sharing those teachings with others. And then during their lifetime, countless other people are led and guided to this enlightened mental state that those people can see for themselves that their mind has awakened because they get to this peaceful, calm, serene and content mind with joy that has focus, concentration, memory and clarity of thought. So during a Buddha's lifetime, he will teach countless people to awaken the mind through his self-discovered teachings that are very unique to him. Then once he dies, those people who are left behind and enlightened, they will share the teachings with other people. And after a Buddha's death, more and more countless people will continue to attain enlightenment after their death. So these are kind of like the three main criteria of a Buddha, but there's actually a lot more than just that. But the three main criteria are self-awakened, that they lead countless other people to enlightenment during their lifetime, and then after they die, more and more and more people become enlightened after their death. So during the Gautama Buddha's lifetime, they actually didn't even call him a Buddha because people weren't 100% sure that he was a Buddha unless they actually learned with him. If they learned with him and they saw that their mind was improving and getting to this enlightened mental state, and they happened to ask him, who taught you? And he says, nobody. I learned this by myself then those people whose minds awakened and they know that he doesn't have any teachers, they knew that he was a Buddha. But other people didn't know he's a Buddha. It's not like there's some you know, music playing wherever he walks. So during his lifetime, they actually called him Aesthetic Gautama, which basically means Monk Gautama or Master Teacher Gautama. It wasn't until he died that we started referring to him as the Buddha or Gautama Buddha, because more and more and more people just kept getting more and more enlightened during his lifetime and after he died. And we know that he didn't have any teachers that led him to the final enlightenment. So that's how we know he was a Buddha. So this first phrase, this first aspect of the chant is essentially acknowledging and showing confidence that yes, you are the perfectly enlightened one, the worthy one, rightly self-awakened, I bow down before the awakened, perfectly enlightened one. And this is a chant that people kind of develop after he died as a way of showing respect to him. Then the next phrase is for his teachings and showing respect to his teachings. The way that this one goes is like this. Sawakato Mahakavata Tammo Tamang Namasami. So, what this chant is saying, or this phrase, is the Dhamma is well expounded by the perfectly enlightened one. I pay respect to the Dhamma. What you're essentially saying is, the teachings are well explained by the Buddha. I pay respect to the teachings, right? So that's what this one is essentially saying. That word Dhamma means teachings. You might have heard the word Dharma. It's two different languages, Pali versus Sanskrit. I tend to use the Pali because that's the source of Gautama Buddha's teachings. But this word Dhamma or Dharma essentially is the teachings of the Buddha that lead to awakening. And in this phrase, we're essentially saying, you explained them really well to us. We pay respect to your teachings, right? And then the third phrase here, it goes like this. Supatipano mhakavato sawakasanko 
Sanghang Namami. Okay, so what this one is, is this is saying the Sangha of the perfectly enlightened one's disciples has practiced well. I pay respect to the Sangha. What you're saying here is the community of practitioners, the ordained novices, bikinis, and bhikkhus, as well as all the household practitioners that are practicing the teachings of the perfectly enlightened one of the Buddha, his disciples, his practitioners, people who are practicing within that community, those who are learning and practicing his teachings, they're doing so very well. They're practicing well. They're polite, they're friendly, they're kind, they're respectful, they're practicing well, right? I pay respect to the community, all the people who are learning and practicing these teachings. So that's what this third phrase is doing. And if you notice, each one of these phrases, there's kind of a pause, and that's where there's this kind of like half breath that we all take. So if you're chanting the first phrase, Arahang Samma Samhoto Mahakava. There's kind of a half breath here. Potang Mahakavanang Apivate Ami. And then when you take your bow, you take a real nice deep breath. Sawakato Mahakavata Dhammo. Kind of a little half breath. Dhamang Namasami. Nice big breath. Supatipano Mahakavato. Half breath. Sawaka Sanko Half breath Sankang Namami Okay, so this is where as you're developing that focus, concentration, memory, and clarity of thought, you're not only becoming aware of the mind during chanting, but you're starting to become aware of the breath. Because when you first start learning these, your breath's going to be off, right? You're going to be, your mind's going to be overactive. You're going to try to probably put a lot of pressure on yourself to try to remember these in a really short amount of time. You're going to have this craving to hurry up and memorize them because you want them to do them so perfectly rather than just taking your time, relaxing with it, and just know that it's a gradual process of learning these teachings and gradually implementing them into your life little by little, what you may decide end up doing is you may your breath might be a little bit out of sync, you might not be quite as calm, but what you need to focus on because you're leading into meditation is just focus on calming the mind, calming the breath, and just calmly and peacefully take a nice deep breath Arahang Samma Samhoto Mahakava Breath Potang Mahakavanang Apivate Me Right, it should just be nice and peaceful as you're chanting. So let's do this one together. But before we do, let me just pause and see if there's any questions whatsoever on this actual chant before we actually do it together as a class. No questions at the moment. Okay. So what you want to do then is take whatever position you normally meditate in, either sitting in a chair or sitting on the floor with your legs crossed. You know, if you're sitting on the floor, you might want to put some cushions under your rear to kind of lessen the angle at your hip. And just kind of like sit down and kind of start getting a little bit relaxed. Next, bring your hands together palm to palm at your sternum in the front of your chest. And now take a nice deep breath, breathing in through the nose and now 
Half breath. Putang Mahaka Wanang Apiwati Ami. Now raise your hands up to your forehead and just do a little bow. Bringing your hands back to your sternum. Nice deep breath. Sawakato Mahakavata Tamo. Half breath. Damang Namasami. Nice bow. Deep breath. Supatipano Mahakavato. Sawaka Sanko Sankhang Namami. Nice bow. Okay, so I didn't give you the cue for the breaths on that last statement. So hopefully you found those yourself, right? It's Supatipano Pakawato. Little breath. Sawaka Sanko. Little breath. Sankang Namami. And then you bow. Okay? Let's do this one one more time. And I'm not going to cue the breath here. I'm just going to let you kind of find it yourself. You'll kind of hear the pause in my voice and you'll kind of know that that's the time to take a breath. Okay? So here we go. Nice deep breath, and then you're on your own. Arahang Samma Samhoto Mahakava Hotang Pakavan Hang Apiwate Ami. Sawakato Mahakavata Dhammo Dhamang Namasami Supatipano Mahakavato Sawaka Sankho Sanghang Namami. All right. So if we were in the same room together, especially if we were in a temple, all of our voices would be harmonizing together and all these sounds would blend. Most of these temples are all very well acoustic, right? Like when you chant in these temples, it really becomes very acoustic and all of our voices blend in together. And if you've got 5, 10, 20, 50, 100, 500 people all chanting this together in this acoustic environment, it just sounds so beautiful and so relaxing and so soothing to the mind to kind of ease the mind down into meditation. Okay? So if you join a temple environment, whether it's in Sri Lanka and Miramar and Laos and Cambodia, southern vietnam and thailand these are kind of like the core places where theravada buddhist teachings are but in reality they've really spread all throughout the world so there's a good chance that there's a theravada temple in your area but those countries that i mentioned are kind of like the focal point of the theravada teachings that have kind of collected and have the most practitioners in those regions of the world but you'll find places even like America or South America or Canada, the UK, other places, the Australia, all over the world that will have Theravada temples. And you can join in and actually chant this all together as a community. And it really has a way of kind of bringing everyone together. So this is the first chant, the triple gem or the triple jewel. The next chant is called the Natmotasa. This is just the same phrase repeated over three times. And if you wanted to kind of focus on just one really, really simple chant, 
and really master that first before going on to the others, this might be the one you do that with. That's how I learned is I started with this chant and I just did this one over and over and over again because once you learn this one, then these same sounds and same words show up in some of the other chants. So this is very common for Thai children to just kind of learn this one first. So that's why I started with this one because I saw myself as a child since I didn't grow up with these teachings at the age of 27, 28, when I started learning these, I started to start kind of right where the Thai children start, which is with this chant. And then I moved into the triple gem. So the way that this one goes, it goes like this. Nap mo tasa pakawato breath arahato sama samputasa. That's one phrase. And then we repeat it two more times. Nap mo tasa pakawato. Arahato sama samputasa. Nap mod hasa pakawato. Half breath. Arahato sama samputasa. So there's no bowing here. It's just the same phrase repeated three times. And the translation here is respect to the perfectly enlightened one, the worthy one, the rightly self-awakened one, essentially paying respect to the Buddha as the Buddha. Okay, so let's chant this one together. Same thing with your hands at your sternum. Take a nice deep breath in through the nose, becoming aware of that breath. And now, Nap mod hasa pakawato arahato sama samputasa. Nap mod hasa pakawato half breath arahato sama samputasa. Nice deep breath. Nap mod hasa pakawato half breath arahato sama samputasa. Okay, so that's the same phrase repeated three times. Let's do it again, but I won't cue the breath. You take that little half breath in the middle and take that bigger breath at the end before we start the next phrase. Okay, so hands at the sternum, nice deep breath in through the nose. Nap mod hasa pakawato arahato sama samputasa. Nap mod hasa pakawato. Arahato sama samputasa. Nap mod hasa pakawato. Arahato sama samputasa. Okay, so that's the second chant that I always do leading into meditation and coming out of meditation. Okay. Let's move to the third chant. This one I call the Iti Piso. This one is also respect for the Buddha, but it kind of goes beyond just what we've been chanting so far. So let's learn the Pali part of this first, and then I'll share with you the English. So the way this one goes in Pali, this is kind of more of an intermediate chant, right? It's not quite beginner anymore. So there's a lot more syllables here. The way this one goes, is it starts like this. Nice deep breath. Iti piso mahakawa. Half breath. Arahang samasam hoto. Right, that's the phrase from the previous chant. So you've got some repetition here. Nice deep breath. We cha chara nang sam hono. Half breath. 
สขาโตโรกาวิตุ Nice deep breath. อานุเตโรภูริสะ Half breath. ดามาสัตติสัตตาวามานุสนัง Half breath. ภูโตปะกวาติ Kind of right there at the end. That's the last. Raise up to the Head, you take your hands and raise up to the head, and that's where you slip into meditation. Okay, so let's go through this one, and I'll cue the breath for you. Hands at your sternum, nice deep breath, in through the nose. Iti piso mahakawa, half breath. อาระหังสัมมาสัมโหโต Deep breath วิจาจารนังสัมโหโน Half breath สขาโตโรกาวิตุ Big breath อานุเตโรภูริสะ Half breath ดามาสัตติสัตตาวามานุสนัง Half breath ภูโตปะกวาติ Okay so there I cue the breath for you We'll do this one again without the cueing. Okay, I'm teaching you the cues where I take breaths because there's these natural pauses as everybody chants together, and I notice that's a good place to take a breath. But if you find another place that's more comfortable for you to take a breath, go for it. Right? It's not about everyone has to do the breath exactly when David does the breath, but if this helps you to learn to take the breath at this point, then go ahead and use it. But honestly, the important thing is is that you're developing that focus, concentration, memory, and clarity of thought, easing the mind down into meditation. So wherever you find it comfortable to take a breath, go for it. If the guidance I'm giving you helps you, go ahead and use it. Okay. So let's do this one again, and I won't cue the breaths. Nice deep breath in. อิติปิโสมหากวาอาระหังสัมมาสัมโหโตวิจาจารนังสัมโหโนสขาโตโรกาวิตุอนุเตโรภูริสะตามาสัตติสัตตาวามานุสนังภูโตภะกวาติ Okay, what this chant means is it. In English, it means he is the perfectly enlightened one, a worthy one, a self-awakened one. Okay, we've seen that before. Consumer it in knowledge, in conduct. Right. So this is like he's kind of mastered deep wisdom of knowledge and conduct. One who has gone the good way. Right. So he's walking towards the light. He's gone the good way. He's got this great wisdom and conduct. Knower of the worlds. Knower of the worlds is he knows of the five realms. The five realms of existence being hell, afflicted spirits, animal, human, and heavenly realm. So he's the knower of these worlds. Unexcelled trainer of those who can be taught. Right. So he's training through his teachings. He's training people. Of how to have this good moral conduct, this ethical behavior, and this mental discipline through this wisdom that he has. So he's an unexcelled trainer of those who can be taught. 
essentially those who choose to be taught, right? The Buddha wasn't going out and forcing people to learn what it is that he had to learn and kind of scaring them, guilting them or shaming them or fearing them into learning his teachings. But instead it was, okay, there's this mental state that I've obtained. Here it is. Here's the guidance. If you choose to learn it and practice it, then here it is and you'll see the benefit for yourself. So it's really those who choose to be taught, those who can be taught. Someone who turns away without confidence in the Buddha, without access to the teachings or without politeness and kindness to the community of practitioners, they can't be taught because they're not even interested. They're off doing things that are unwholesome. So it's those who can be taught, right? Teacher of humans and divine beings. These are the two realms where beings can attain enlightenment. In the hell afflicted spirits and animal realm, those beings can't attain enlightenment. So it's only in the human realm and in the heavenly realm that beings can actually attain awakening or enlightenment. So that's why we say he's the teacher of humans and divine beings. And then we follow it up with awakened and perfectly enlightened. Remember, perfectly or fully perfectly enlightened means he didn't have any teachers. He didn't have anyone to influence his mind, and therefore his mind was fully awake and perfectly enlightened because he could see these teachings and observe these teachings for himself, and that's what made his mind perfectly enlightened. It's not tainted or influenced by any other teachers right? So he's the unexcelled trainer of those who can be taught, teacher of human and divine beings, awakened and perfectly enlightened. That's the meaning of this chant. Any questions on this chant? We have a question from Joy on the pronunciation. Mm -hmm. She asks, I just want to make sure that the PH is not pronounced as a F sound or as a F sound. Yeah, it's more of a P, P. So iti piso hakawa pa pakawa yeah like a pa pa got it thanks for that I suggest we move on we have a couple of questions which I'll save for the end okay so let's go to the very first chant the arahang samasamputasa we're going to chant this all the way through then we're going to go to the natmotasa right on through we're not going to stop or pause. Max and I are going to change the text for you guys so you can see it. Then we're going to move right into the ETP so so that you can get this feeling of going all the way through the chants and then easing the mind right into meditation from there. And we'll just kind of pretend that we're easing the mind into meditation since we've got a few questions that we'll take after we learn chanting. We won't really go into meditation today. Okay, and that kind of wasn't the plan, but I thought if we had time, we could, but you guys can do that on your own. So let's just kind of get the habit and the practice of going all the way through all three chants. So bring your hands together. I'm not going to cue the breath here. Just bring your hands together at your sternum. Take a nice deep breath and let's chant. Arahang Samma Sammoto Mahakawa Potang Mahakawan Hang Apiwatiami Sawakato Mahakawata Tamo Tamang Namasami Supatipano Mahakawato Sawaka Sanko Sanghang Namami Napmodhasa Pakavato Arahato Samma Samputasa 
नपमोर्हसागवतो हर हतो संभूत स नपमोर्हसागवत हर हतो संभूत स पीसो महकवा हंग समूत वि चाचारण सामुनो सखा तो तु अनु तेरो फूरी सा सावा मनु सनंग भूतो भगवाती ओके feel like we should clap it up as if we could really hear each other but yeah let's clap it up right so these chants they're really interesting and really fun to kind of do and it leads you to developing this focus concentration memory clarity of thought it helps to ease the mind into meditation developing this awareness of mind and this awareness of the breath and if you would like more help with this Every three weeks, I will teach this again, and at different times, I will actually have you guys chant. This time, since it's an introduction to Buddhist chanting, I'm doing all the chanting, and kind of you guys are on mute. But as you practice this over the next three weeks, and you would like personal guidance, as you come to class in the virtual classroom, you guys will be able to actually get personal guidance because you'll be able to chant. And I'll be able to give you personal guidance. So keep practicing this using this podcast or this video in order to practice over each day over the next coming weeks. And then, as we get to this three weeks from now, we will deepen this, and I will help you refine it more and more. Another option that you have is on the podcast or on our YouTube channel. I have a episode two. In the podcast is a guided meditation for breathing mindfulness meditation. In episode two, I do the chants at the beginning and then take you into meditation from there. And it's only a 15-minute podcast, so right there you can get the chanting right at the beginning, and you can play that while you're actually chanting. So if you have it in the headphones or you have it playing over some speakers, you have me kind of chanting along with you. As you're doing the chanting as well, because it's kind of nice to hear it from the teacher as you're looking at the paper or you're looking at the book and you're actually trying to chant along with the teacher. So feel free to use episode two of the podcast or find this video or other videos on the YouTube channel where I've actually been chanting, and you can kind of chant along with me as you develop your practice. So, are there any questions about chanting or anything else that we've been covering, either in this chapter three, what is enlightenment, what is nibbana, or any questions from your meditation practice, or any questions at all that you need help with in order to deepen your understanding and practice of these teachings? We have a question from Judith. She asks, "Why can't animals become enlightened?" Okay, so in the animal realm. Animals don't have the ability to learn the teachings, so they can't read a book, they can't watch a video, and actually understand it to a level to implement the teachings in daily life, where they're now cultivating and training the mind. Because on this path to enlightenment, what we're doing is we're either eliminating certain qualities from the mind, which you're going to learn more about as we progress. Or you're cultivating certain qualities in the mind, and just give you a few examples, right? Like some of the qualities that we're going to cultivate are things like loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, equanimity. Where some domesticated animals have a little bit of those qualities, 
they can't fully cultivate those and they can't fully eliminate this craving, anger, or ignorance, or unknowing of true reality. So for example, like a lion or a tiger or a bear, they can't get rid of their hostility. They can't stop killing other beings because that's how they survive. They won't stop stealing, right? They steal food from people, that's, but also from other beings, they steal. They also have sexual misconduct. They have many different partners. They don't speak, so they don't lie and they don't usually take substances that cause heedlessness, but they have no ability to understand these teachings, bring them into the consciousness intellectually, reflect on those teachings, and then either train the mind to eliminate certain qualities and cultivate certain qualities in the mind. So they're unable in the animal realm to attain enlightenment. However, they're going to be reborn many, many, many times and ultimately make it into the human world where they will have the opportunity to attain enlightenment in the human birth. And even you yourself, Joy, you don't probably remember it now, but you've had many, many, many animal existences that led you to the point where now you're in the human world and you have this opportunity to learn and practice the teachings to actually attain enlightenment. But being in an animal birth the Buddha described it as being trapped in a prison because you have countless rebirths in the animal world before you ever make it into the human world and have the opportunity. So we really should kind of treasure and appreciate this human birth and not allow it to go to waste now that we've obtained it. We should apply effort and energy and dedication to learn and practice because if we don't attain enlightenment and we are reborn into a lower realm, Once again, it's almost like a prison being trapped until you finally have so many countless births that you ultimately make it back to the human realm again. So it sounds, David, like animals do have a mind. They do have consciousness and they do experience mental states, but they don't have the ability to cultivate that consciousness deliberately. So they don't really have any understanding of the natural law of karma. What wholesome actions they do take and what unwholesome actions they do take is more or less entirely out of impulse, craving uh, and anger. And so through their conditioning, almost by luck, they may well become reborn as as a human in a a more favorable state, but not because they've actively cultivated it, but because through the the forces acting upon them, I suppose. Is that fair to say? Yeah, pretty, pretty true that last part of forces acting upon them i I don't agree with that part but everything else you said 100 percent agree with that this natural law of gamma which we're going to learn about in this program it's a natural law it exists just like gravity is a natural law and we were largely unaware of it throughout our early parts of our lives we were unaware of this natural law of gravity we just kind of gradually got more and more wisdom about this natural law of gravity until we became really aware of it and awakened to this natural law of gravity. Then we started learning to place our glass of water here and place our important things here so they don't fall down and get hurt. We learned to kind of make our bodies stronger so we can roam and move about the world. So the more awakened, the more wisdom that we got about this natural law of gravity, the more peaceful we could function in the world based on this natural law. Well, the natural law of gamma is essentially the same thing, is that people are unaware of it. People are unawakened to it. People don't have the wisdom of this natural law. But what the Buddhist teachings are doing is awakening your mind to understand this natural law in such detail that you can actually independently observe this natural law at play at any given time. And with this wisdom, you then make better and better choices in life based on this natural law of gamma. So as human beings, we can cultivate this understanding and this wisdom of this natural law of gamma, and we can consciously make choices based on this wisdom to improve our life and improve our consciousness and essentially become more peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. But an animal has no ability to observe this natural law and cultivate this wisdom and make corrections in their life in order to improve their consciousness because they're kind of inhibited just by the fact that in order to live, a lot of animals have to kill, 
they don't live otherwise. So that's why they're kind of trapped in a prison is that they don't have the ability to cultivate the consciousness and understand this natural law. However, because it is a natural law, it's at play all the time. So a lion who's constantly killing, they're affected by the results of that. Lions, for example, who are constantly killing, they oftentimes get killed themselves, right? This is the gamma that they're constantly killing other species in order to eat, but then other lions or other animals like hyenas and things like this will kill them. This is their gamma coming back to them, right? Versus like, say, like an elephant who, an elephant is very revered in Buddhist culture because an elephant is kind of like the animal that's closest to the human birth. Because if you think about an elephant, they don't eat meat, so they're not killing typically. They can kill and they will kill if they're threatened because they are an animal at heart, right? But they don't kill normally. That's not part of their normal behaviors. They tend to be very loving, very compassionate. They really look out for all the various members of their family. They kind of band together very closely. And because of this, Elephants have focus, concentration, memory, right? Elephants are really well known for a lot of memory. So in terms of animal beings that are closest to practicing teachings that are going to produce the results of what an enlightened mind is going to experience, it's an elephant that has that, right? Elephants have very little fear. They have this deep compassion, you know, a lot of love, a lot of kindness. So that's why they have much more concentration and they have deep memories in the elephant birth. So all these animals in the animal world are being affected by the decisions that they make, even though they're unaware of them, just like human beings. There's human beings in the world that are utterly unaware of the natural law of gamma, but they're still affected by it. So let me give you an example. One of the things that you're going to learn in this practice is something called right speech, which is how to speak in a way that doesn't cause harm to other beings. Gautama Buddha doesn't tell you exactly what to say, but he kind of gives you this little bit of guidance of ensuring that you don't cause any harm in your speech. One of the things that he teaches is the five factors of well-spoken speech. He says you should speak at the right time. What you say is true. You should speak gently. You should speak in a way that's beneficial or purposeful speech. And you should speak with a mind of loving kindness without blame to others. Okay, we're going to dive into this in about two weeks. But the more you understand what right speech is and you practice this, what you're going to see is your personal and professional relationships are going to significantly improve because you're always speaking at the right time. Everything you say is true. You're speaking gently. You speak in a way that's beneficial and you speak with a mind of loving kindness, active goodwill towards others without blaming other beings. So these are the teachings. And the more that you bring your practice up to that, you will realize the results and the benefits of having done so. That's the natural law of gamma around speech. However, even though there's beings in the world today, human beings that are unaware of that, as they speak, if they're speaking at the wrong time, like when people interrupt you, people don't like to be around that guy, right? Or that girl. Or if someone's always lying, people don't like to be around that person. Like you're not gonna have a real deep relationship with that person. And there's probably a lot of people that are around that person who also lie. If someone speaks hostile, right? They're not speaking gently. If someone's real harsh with their language, Nobody likes to be around that person. That person isn't going to be able to cultivate healthy personal and professional relationships. If someone speaks unbeneficially, frivolous speech, idle chatter, just yada, 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 without purpose, it's kind of like bothers the mind for a lot of people to hear that. So people don't like to be around that person who just speaks with frivolous speech. And if someone speaks without a mind of loving kindness, if they have ill will 
or anger or hatred. Nobody likes to be around that person either. And that person's going to find it hard to have deep personal and professional relationships. And if you go around blaming other people for all your problems and all the problems in your life, if you're blaming others, then you're going to find it hard to have personal and professional relationships. So this natural law of gamma, animals are unaware of it, but they're affected by it. The large majority of the human world is unaware of this natural law of gamma and these good, wholesome teachings, this wisdom from the Buddha, they're unaware of it, but they're still affected by it. So natural law of gamma, it isn't this mystical, magical thing in the sky of punishment and rewards. That's what some people think it is. This mystical, magical thing that's delivering punishment and rewards. That's not what the natural law of gamma is. It's essentially the results of our decisions. By choosing to speak at the right time, true, gentle, beneficially, with a mind of loving kindness, without blame, then we're going to experience better personal and professional relationships because this is how everybody functions in the world. We function around these same universal teachings, the same natural laws of existence. So the gamma is actually right here, right? If I wasn't speaking at the right time, if what I said wasn't true, if I was speaking very harshly and very hostile, if what I said wasn't beneficial, if I didn't speak with a mind of loving kindness and I was blameful, you guys wouldn't even be interested in learning with me, right? Like Max wouldn't be willing to participate and be the moderator you guys wouldn't be interested in learning because, wow, every time this guy talks, he's hostile, he's aggressive, he lies, he doesn't speak with purpose, he blames other people for all the problems in his life, he has anger and hostility and hatred when he talks. People don't like to be around that. So even when we're unaware of these teachings, we're still affected by them. So that's how you improve the condition of the mind and the condition of your life is by awakening or, in other words, by gaining the wisdom of these teachings. Now you'll make better and better choices in your life based on this natural law of gamma. And that's why you're going to see the results in the condition of the mind and your life improve more and more. So we have a follow up comment from Joy. She says that animals can learn right from wrong. So how does that play in? They can learn a little bit, but they can't learn enough to get to enlightenment, right? So like an animal can learn to go outside to the bathroom, a domesticated animal, right? Can learn to go outside to go to the bathroom or an animal can learn, you know, to not tip over their food when they're eating. There's certain little things like this that they can learn, but they can't learn the level of wisdom that it takes to attain enlightenment. So if a dog even a domesticated dog, right, is in the yard, in their yard, and another dog walks by or a cat walks by, that dog, sure, you can train that away, but there's other things, but I'll just give you an example. That dog sees and takes ownership over that land and it protects it. This is the self. This is the dog craving permanence of that land. And then when it sees impermanence and another dog comes around, it becomes very protective and hostile. It's very hard for animals to eliminate that, right? There are certain qualities that domesticated animals can improve, but they'll never fully awaken to the wisdom of these teachings based on all the things that you're gonna learn as part of the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, the five precepts and all the other teachings that you're going to learn as part of these practices. One of the big things is animals can't usually eliminate fear, right? They're always going to have this sense of fear. Animals can eliminate the self. They have to maintain the self because if they let the self go in the protection of a self, they die because there's predators in the world. So they have to maintain that self and they have to protect that self. Where human beings, we have the self as we're born into the world, but we can eliminate it, and we don't need to hold on to this self. 
We don't need to hold on to this ego. We don't need to hold on to this hatred and anger and hostility where animals, if they let that stuff go, they don't have the ability to let it go. But if they did, they would end up dying because the other predators would take advantage of that and they would kill them. We have a follow up from Messiah. I'm still unsure of how animals can then progress the human realm. So it happens because this natural law, right? There's this natural law that exists and it affects all of us, whether we're human or any other being. And based on just the animals just doing what animals do, they just will eventually accumulate enough of good decisions that it will lead them to a good life. So for example, like a snake, it's really hard for a snake to become a human because they're constantly killing. Right. And snakes are sometimes very vicious and poisonous and they kill. And that's why they also have a very short life. Right. They usually typically live about 10 to 20 years for most snakes. So a snake to go from a snake straight into human is not very likely because they're making the decisions that they're making. They're not consciously making them. They're just making them because they're a snake. And that's the consciousness of a snake. But this natural law of gamma is always at play. But that snake can maybe be reborn as a lion. And then that lion can be reborn as a turtle. And that turtle, now not causing harm to others, is maybe now reborn as an elephant. And now maybe those elephants are being reborn into the human realm. So they're not consciously making the decision to become a human but just based on their decisions and the way that they conduct their life, they will naturally move into the human world. Judith asks, if animals drop the aversion and craving and this aggressiveness, other animals take advantage of them and they can't survive. Is it different for humans? It's different for humans. We can still survive because we have discernment, right? We have wise decision making where animals don't have necessarily wise decision-making all the time. So we can eliminate the self and the ego, this craving, this anger, this unknowing of truality. And now based on the wisdom that we've cultivated in the mind, we can apply that to what we call discernment. Discernment is like wise decision-making. So if we develop our mind and cultivate our consciousness and we eliminate this craving, anger, ignorance, this self and this ego, but we're around people who are trying to scam us or trying to take advantage or trying to harm us in some way, we can use that wise decision making to remedy the situation, whatever that ends up being where an animal doesn't have that capacity to be able to make decisions based off of cultivated wisdom necessarily. They have some wisdom, you know, they learn certain instinctual behaviors and certain decisions that they learn from their parents, but not to the level of the detail of what a human can cultivate. Okay, so we have some questions on meditation now. Mm -hmm. Kamen asks, how do you know if you're meditating? If you're trying to train the mind, then you're meditating, okay? What meditation is, is it's a active, independent, purposeful, dedicated training session where you're attempting to train the mind to either eliminate certain qualities or cultivate certain qualities in the mind. So with breathing mindfulness meditation, the foundational meditation that the Buddha taught, here you're training the mind to eliminate craving pretty much that's what you're doing with breathing mindfulness meditation and on sunday we're going to talk more about why that is with loving kindness meditation you're training the mind to cultivate loving kindness or this active goodwill in the mind without judgment so if you're going for a jog you're not meditating, you're going for a jog, or if you're going for a drive, you're going for a drive, or if you're gardening, or you're listening to music, you're listening to music, or you're gardening, you're not actually meditating because it's not an independent, active, dedicated training session to eliminate certain qualities from the mind and cultivate certain qualities in the mind. And we're gonna get into, in this program, what are those qualities that we're looking to eliminate and what are those qualities that we're looking to cultivate 
in meditation, right? So meditation, there are certain qualities that we're eliminating and cultivating, but also in daily life, there are certain qualities that we're eliminating and cultivating as well, but we're not doing it through an active independent training session. So like those 10 fetters, right? One of the things you saw in the 10 fetters is conceit or arrogance, right? Judgment of others, placing yourself above or below others, kind of measuring and comparing yourself to others, this ego. You can't meditate ego away. So you can't meditate something in order to eliminate the ego by itself. You have to do that in daily life and practice. So there's certain qualities of mind in order to attain enlightenment that you need to eliminate from the mind and you need to cultivate. The main aspects of those you're doing in meditation, but there's also certain qualities of mind in daily life that you need to also eliminate, conceit, arrogance, the ego, right? And there's certain qualities that you need to cultivate in daily life, like generosity, right? Sharing. You can't develop that in meditation. You can't meditate your way to generosity. You have to actually practice it in daily life. So throughout this program, as I slowly roll out this carpet for you to expose more and more and more of the teachings, I will show you how in meditation you're actually cultivating or eliminating certain qualities. And then in daily life, you're also either eliminating or cultivating various qualities of the mind. And this is how you're going to train the mind to get to enlightenment. But meditation itself is an active, dedicated, independent, purposeful training session where you're either actively eliminating certain qualities or cultivating certain qualities in the mind. Thanks, David. I think that can be quite reassuring because sometimes there can be a tendency, can't they, to sit down and think, am I meditating? And the mind's getting really busy. Am I meditating? Am yeah. I just thinking? I, I, had, I have had students do this where I've taught them meditation and after meditating, I'll say, how did it go? And they'll say, I just had all these thoughts. There was all these thoughts. I don't even know if I was meditating because I just had all these thoughts rushing to my mind. Well, if you became aware of those thoughts, then you're actually meditating because you're developing awareness of mind, right? That's part of what you're cultivating as part of meditation is you're cultivating mindfulness or awareness of mind. So in that situation, I said, yes, of course you were meditating, even though your mind was bombarded with all these thoughts and you never got to a point where there was this complete peaceful mind, you were still meditating because each meditation session, you walk away with something. And if you walk away from this meditation session with, wow, there's so many thoughts in my mind. I was just bombarded by all these thoughts. That's good. That's beneficial. Sometimes people walk away from that experience and feel guilty or shameful or feel like, oh gosh, I can't meditate. It's just so many thoughts in the mind. I can't meditate, so therefore I'm not going to do it. Well, if you sit down and you're bombarded with all these thoughts, yes, you are meditating. You're developing awareness of mind, which is mindfulness. And if you're bombarded with thoughts in meditation, you absolutely should be meditating. That's the whole reason to meditate. But occasionally I'll hear from somebody that says they've actually turned away from meditation because they feel like they can't do it because they're so bombarded with thoughts. But that's exactly why they should be doing it. This is where guidance from a teacher is really helpful to help you see, no, 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 no need to feel guilty or shameful. That's just the condition of the mind right now at this moment. But the purpose of meditation is to gradually improve that. You're not going to just sit down and just instantly become enlightened with one session of meditation. It's going to be a gradual, dedicated practice that brings the mind gradually to this enlightened mental state through this gradual training. We have another question from Cayman. Are your eyes supposed to be closed? For the most part with meditation, closing the eyes is the best way to do it. Because what you're doing is you're closing down the various senses. There is one meditation that I teach, or actually two meditations that I teach, where the eyes are open. That's walking meditation, because you need your eyes open for that. Although there are ways to do it with your eyes closed. And there's also a meditation for sexual craving. This is a specialized meditation that only 
uh, certain people need if you have a lot of craving for sexual activity. It's not one that everyone needs to know. But as you're working with the teacher, if you're having challenges with a sexual craving like pornography or masturbation or if you're having just excessive amount of partners and having lots of sex with lots of people and you want to knock that down and bring it down to kind of maybe just one partner, then this particular meditation you do with your eyes open. But for the most part, you should be closing your eyes to shut down that sensory of the eye that's taking in information and helping to bombard the mind with thoughts. So by closing the eyes, you're closing one of the doorways to the mind. The five senses are the doorways to the mind. There's nothing that's ever going to cause discontentedness in the mind unless it comes through one of those doorways. The eyes, the nose, the tongue, the ears, and physical contact on the body. When you get some kind of sensory stimulation through these five senses, it can cause discontentedness in the mind. So by closing the eyes during meditation, you are protecting that doorway. You're guarding that doorway to discontentedness so that you can deepen your meditation. Just a follow up for me there, David. So these doorways to discontentedness, is the mind a doorway? And what about a feeling of say hunger or some other physical sensation that isn't on the skin? So the physical sensation from the hunger is the phys- it's contact. It's the physical contact. It's that hunger is the physical aspect going to the mind saying i'm hungry you feel the pain and now the mind becomes discontent rather than the mind recognizing that is impermanent and then just making a decision to get something to eat people sometimes get angry and hostile so we do have six doorways to discontentedness and the mind is one of those but it's the senses the five senses that draw in to the mind. We're going to talk this Sunday about the three feelings, painful, pleasant, and neither painful nor pleasant. It's these three feelings that get produced in the mind based on input into these senses. So one of the things you do is you protect your doorways to discontentedness, or the Buddha said, guard your doorways to discontentedness. So if you know, for example, that you have a lot of craving for sexual activity, right? And you've got this one partner and you're trying to really be faithful and trusting and loyal in this relationship. And you know you have craving for sexual activity. Well, it wouldn't be wise for you to go places like a strip club or see pornography or look at magazines with really beautiful imagery of certain beings because that coming into the senses is going to excite that craving to go out and potentially have sexual contact with somebody other than your partner. So if you're applying what we call right effort, which we'll get to in about a week and a half, you apply effort to abandon this from the mind, then you would protect or you would guard this doorway by not choosing to take in information that's going to excite this craving. We have a question from Deborah. Sometimes when I meditate, no thoughts come in. I find that the only thoughts I have are the fact that I have no thoughts. Am I doing something wrong? Nope, nothing at all. If you're having no thoughts, then that's fine. So in meditation, if you're focused on the breath, and the mind's going to the past or the future, or if it's having all these thoughts, ideas, perceptions, the goal is in breathing mindfulness meditation is to cut those off and bring the mind to the breath to train it to reside in the present moment and train the mind to let go. Because what you're going to hear on Sunday is the real problem with the mind is it holds on. And this is what causes the discontent mind. So what we're doing in breathing mindfulness meditation is training the mind to let go, to let go, to let go. And then through this training, now you have control over the mind. And now because you've trained your mind so well in multiple sessions of meditation, you may get to the point in meditation where there are no thoughts whatsoever because you've trained it so well that you get to a period of time where it's just completely peaceful because the mind's 
perfectly residing in the middle where there is no wandering to the past, there is no wandering to the future, and the mind is just perfectly in the present moment in the middle, and this is where the mind's performing optimally. And that's in meditation where you may not have any thoughts. So by clearing the mind out and emptying it out this way in meditation, what you're essentially doing is you're making space for wholesome thoughts once you're outside of meditation. So if your mind is bombarded by all these unwholesome thoughts or just even wholesome thoughts, just being bombarded with lots of thoughts, it's hard to have that focus, that concentration, that memorization, that clarity of thought because the mind is just being bombarded. But the more you train the mind and you get these spaces where there are no thoughts and the mind just resides in the present moment, you've moved aside all this junk, for a lack of better word. And then now in daily life, when a thought arises from a wholesome situation, now you can apply effort to implementing that idea or implementing that initiative. And this is where you'll have lots of benefit in your life because now, rather than your thoughts being motivated by all this cluttered, unwholesome junk, your thoughts are arising in this pure mind that's not affected by craving, anger, and ignorance by the self or the ego. And because you've purified this mind, now all the decisions that you're making are coming from a wholesome place, a purified place. So when you implement these into the world, you have a lot of success. And you can realize a lot of benefits that way rather than trying to implement something based on various unwholesome cravings or hatred or different things that motivate our decisions in the unenlightened state. In the unenlightened state, our decisions are motivated by this craving, anger, and ignorance, this self and this ego. And this is why we cause so many problems for ourselves, and we struggle in life because our decisions are motivated out of these impure qualities of mind. But by training the mind towards this pure, enlightened mental state, now all the ideas and thoughts and things that we come up with are coming from a pure place. This is why the Buddha never told you what to do in your life. He just taught how to purify the mind. Because once you purify the mind, your free will and all the various choices and interests that you have to help the world or help yourself or help your family, they're all going to be coming from a pure place. So you'll figure out what kinds of things you want to do in this life and what kind of things you would like to accomplish. But trying to do that with an impure mind and all this unwholesome mental states, it's very difficult and you struggle through life. But by the Buddha teaching you how to purify the mind, all your decisions now are coming through this purified mind and they're going to have very good results in your personal and professional relationship. We have a comment from Javier. I think I get more focus on the present moment when I hear sounds or David's voice than when not sensing anything. Then I will wander with thoughts for longer. Okay, so that's just where you are right now in your practice, right? So you're at the point where if you hear a sound or you hear my voice, it gives the mind something to focus on and you're latching on and you're holding on to the sound or you're holding on to my voice. That's probably better than maybe where you were when you first started out, but that's okay. You're not quite where you need to be, but you're in the process of doing that. What you'll need to do is once you develop more and more where you're noticing that just when you hear my voice or you hear sound that the mind is focused on that and everything's clear, now what you need to do is you need to start to phase out my voice in your meditations if you're following my guided meditations or if you're using music or sounds you need to phase that out and you need to do it slowly because the mind doesn't like change okay so maybe like two or three sessions you do it with my voice or with sound and then one session without two or three with it and then one without two or three with it and one without then do two with it and two without. Two with it, two without, right? And then you do one with it and three without, or you know, however you decide to do it. Maybe in the morning you do it with my voice or with sound, or maybe in the evening without. You can decide how to kind of ease out 
the sound of my voice or any kind of other sound so that eventually you get to the point where it's just the body, the mind, and the breath. Just those three things. But since your mind is starting to develop this habit, go ahead and let it have this habit of doing meditation on a regular basis, either once, twice, or three times a day. Develop that habit, and once you've got that habit down, now start phasing out this aspect of the mind that wants to hold on to my voice or to any other sound. And the way you do that is just slowly, gradually move it out of your life in this very gradual progression of getting to just the body, the mind, and the breath. Because you don't want to be holding on to anything, even the sound of my voice or any other sound, like music or a gong or something like that. Thank you, David. We have no more questions. Okay, so this is everything that I was planning to cover with you guys today. It's great that you have questions and that you're looking for guidance and you're seeking guidance in your practice. This is a really, really good thing. And this is why we do these sessions on Sunday and Wednesday as well, because Sunday is kind of like the big talk about the individual chapters. And then Wednesday is a time for us to focus in on breathing mindfulness meditation, loving kindness meditation, and chanting. And then we always usually have time for kind of some miscellaneous questions about meditation or what you're learning or what you're applying or anything that you're needing guidance and help with during the middle of the week. So continue to meditate each day. And at this point, now that you have chanting, you can kind of ease that into your practice. So pick up the book or print out this little cheat sheet, which you'll find in our Facebook group. If you go to the Facebook group and you click on the files, there's a link there for the PDF, which is just this one pager front and back. And you can print it if you like and laminate it like I've done if you like. And you can use that. Or if you have the book and you have the book on your electronic device or you have it printed in chapter 11, these same chants are there. And you can implement this into your practice where when you sit down or you however initiate your meditation you can start with the chanting and do this and practice it and then ease into the meditation and then after the meditation then repeat the same three chants coming out today you just learned this intellectually it hasn't really had a chance to really take root and for you to see the benefit yet You need to practice this over many days and many weeks so that you can see the benefit. And as you do and you decide that you want to keep this as part of your practice, once you've given it a really good try and you see multiple, multiple weeks and you see the benefit, go ahead and use it if you like. But if you work with it for many, many weeks and you realize that it's not really helping you, then come back to me and ask me some questions. Make sure that it's something that you really understand and you understand how to do it and then try it some more. And then ultimately, if you get to a point where you really understand what's being done and you've tried it, but you just don't like it and it's not something you wanna do as part of your practice, then just move it to the side and don't even use the chanting because chanting is not a requirement of attaining enlightenment. There's people who are enlightened who don't chant. So it's not a required thing But I think what you'll notice is if you do implement it into your practice, it will be very helpful for you. But you only know that if you actually try it. So try it for several weeks and try to reap the benefits of it as we've talked about today. And then if you see it's improving your practice, use it. That's wonderful. But if it's not, set it to the side, but then be sure you follow Gautama Buddha's guidance of setting up mindfulness in front of you. So if chanting isn't the thing that you ultimately decide you're going to use to set up mindfulness in front of you, find something else. For some people, like I said, it might be yoga. It might be prayer. If some people are doing prayer and you have a a relationship with God, you might choose to do prayer. Some people don't have a relationship with God, and that's fine too. So like I said, it might be yoga. It might be going to the bathroom. It might be just taking some nice deep breaths with your eyes closed and just kind of like soaking into your meditation position, whatever that is. But if chanting can help you, go ahead and use it. 
So I'm glad that you have decided to attend today's class or you're watching this back on the playback or you're listening to this as a podcast because chanting can be something very fun and very useful. It can really benefit your mind in a lot of different ways. It's a practice that is going to further help to train your mind to get that focus, that concentration, that memorization, and that clarity of thought and really ease the mind into meditation and you get more and more benefit out of the meditation. But the only way you're gonna know that is if you develop this life practice of being dedicated with a consistent development of a meditation practice. So keep working on that and keep learning the teachings from the book, the audio book, the videos, the podcast, and all the other resources. Keep in mind that I also offer personal guidance if you would like to reach out to me either by messenger or email. I have a little link that I can send you and you can schedule regular personal sessions or even just one or two if you like where if you would like to talk more personally, just one-on-one, we can do an audio or a video chat in order to give you some personal guidance. And there's students that do that. And of course, everything that I do is offered openly and freely. So you're welcome to do and involve yourself and learn from all of these resources openly and freely to help you continue to progress to this enlightened mental state where your mind's going to be peaceful calm, serene, and content with joy for the rest of this life. So until next time, Sunday at nine o'clock Thai time, whatever time that is in your time zone, have a very good rest of your day and a wonderful rest of your week. And we'll see you then. Sawadee khap. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.